Good evening, all. Welcome to Conversations That Count. Thank you so much, Amber, for joining us. And I apologize, we had some technical difficulties, so the delay is, but I, I thank you for your patience. Uh, viewers, I'm Srileka Pale, Fairfax GOP Face Chair, Vice Chair of Strategy and Engagement. As you know, March is Women's History Month. Through fair, uh, Conversations That Count, Fairfax GOP is celebrating the many achievements of women throughout history in art, athletics, journalism, business, government, philanthropy, humanity, science, and education. Women have contributed a lot to our society and we made some strong, great strides. Throughout the month of uh, March, I encourage you to join Fairfax GOP in celebrating Women's uh, History Month along with us. In honor of this Women's History Month, I have invited a fabulous women on the show today. Amber Athey, everyone's family of faith. She's a well-reputed American journalist based in Washington, DC. Amber is a Washington editor at The Spectator. She was a senior Blankley fellow with the Steamboat Institute. Prior to joining The Spectator, Amber was a White House correspondent for The Daily Caller, and she covered bias and abuse in the, in the university system as an investigative journalist. Um, she, her work has been cited, and I've read many articles of hers by the Washington uh, Post, NBC News, Vanity Fair, Fox News, USA Today. I can go on and on and on. Amber graduated from prestigious Georgetown University in 2016 with a double major in government, economics, and a minor in mathematics. I always say anybody that graduates in mathematics is a, is a genius, in my opinion. <laughs> Amber, I, I am so honored that you're part of conversations that count. I am thankful that you remained patient during our technical issues. And um, covering media and breaking news for one of the America's largest and uh, fastest growing news uh, organization is a huge accomplishment for a young lady like you. And you were also a um, columnist for CatholicVote.org. How did you start this amazing journey in politics, policy making, and even in public life? Yeah, it's a great question. I was definitely raised with conservative values, but I more viewed politics as a hobby. I, I didn't have any illusions that I was going to have a career in politics or policy or reporting or anything like that. But my experience at Georgetown, I think really pushed me into this world. And, and that's because I was one of the very few outspoken conservatives on campus. And the backlash that I received from my liberal classmates was just outrageous. I mean, just a quick story for you guys. My freshman year, I decided with a friend of mine that we were going to try to start a gun club, and we called it the Georgetown University Firearms Association, and I advertised for it on my freshman uh, dorm room door, and I had a little drawing of a gun on there and urged people to sign up, and within maybe a day of the sign being up, I was reported to my RA for creating an unsafe environment for the other students on the floor. And I fought back and you know, cited my right to free speech and luckily was able to keep the sign up. But that was really just the first instance of bias that I would um, experience for the rest of my college career. I got involved with the College Republicans and ended up becoming chair of that organization my junior year. And all of this backlash that I was receiving just told me that it was really important for me to be that strong voice for conservatism on campus because so many of my friends and peers would tell me, you know, I, I'm a Republican or I'm a conservative, but I just don't feel comfortable sharing my views publicly because I'm so afraid of what's going to happen if I were to do that. You know, they're, they're gonna call me a racist, I'm going to lose friends, I could be punished by my professor or the administration. And thank you for speaking up on my behalf. So. After years of doing that, um, I, I really ultimately just decided that this was something that I wanted to make a career out of um, because it's not just college campuses that have this bias. It's the corporate media, it's corporations, it's um, Hollywood and so many cultural institutions that people have to constantly fight back against. And so I thought my experience would be useful in that regard. I ended up working for Campus Reform after graduation, and Campus Reform is a project of the Leadership Institute that reports on these instances of bias um, on campuses across the country. So this was really just an extension of the work that I was already doing at Georgetown, and so it seemed like a perfect fit. And I did that for a year and was really honored to be able to help out students across the country who were battling a lot of the same, th same things that I was when I was an undergrad. 
So Amber, that is quite an inspirational story. I mean, the backlash on the campuses, it's because of somebody like you as a leadership role that takes on and encourages all their fellow students to learn about conservative philosophy and values is the reason why conservatism is still exists. So uh, tell me, Amber, I was a little thrown off by the fact that Georgetown College Republicans is the largest conservative student organization, and it is based out of DC. <laughs> was it hard to kind of work in that conservative organization when knowing that it is a liberal university? How did you attract the students? And also, I'll check their leadership currently, and they have pretty very well diverse students in there. I mean, I saw somebody from El Salvador. I mean, so how are you? How are they attracting these diverse candidates into the leadership roles of college Republicans? Yeah, my my philosophy when I was leading the college Republicans was that it wouldn't really do us any good to be looking for ideological purity because, as you mentioned, DC is such a liberal area, and the campus itself was so liberal that it was kind of like, a, all right, we'll take what we can get. Let's just try to build our coalition and make this a big tent. You know, even if people identified as moderate or they were more establishment Republican and maybe didn't even really identify as conservative, I wanted them to know that it was okay to share their views, even if they didn't align with the liberal orthodoxy. And so I viewed college Republicans primarily as a social organization. This was supposed to be a place where conservatives could come and feel comfortable sharing what they believed in because they knew that there were like-minded individuals just like them, their same age, who believed in the same things. And they could all feel strong doing that because they had this group of people who had their back. So I was planning a lot of social events, um, a lot of outings for students to try to get comfortable with one another and really create this tight-knit friend group before we would get into the policy questions and putting on events with speakers or debates with the college Democrats. Um, the first thing was to make sure that everybody could have a voice. And that was really how we grew the club to over 70 or 80 active members, which um, for a liberal campus like Georgetown is fairly impressive, I think. And we actually um, were pretty close in size to the college Democrats, which was a huge accomplishment. So I was really proud of that. Oh my, that, that's a totally an applaudable situation to have equal amount of students. And uh, just talking about the university settings, I mean, were they, uh, 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 during those times, did you experience any liberal bias and abuse that you wrote about or talked about during, uh, as part of uh, university? Yeah, I had so many experiences at Georgetown. And, you know, when I went to campus reform and started reporting on those issues, I was really proud of the fact that we had so many victories. I mean, one of the greatest things about campus reform is that the reporting that we did there really enacted tangible change at campuses across the country. My colleague and I did a month long investigation into the fact that Students for Hillary organizations across the country were flouting their university policies that prevent them from using university resources to campaign for um, presidential political candidates or collect data for them. And we were able to get some of them kicked off campus for breaking the rules um, and, and having an unfair advantage among young people for Hillary over President Donald Trump. Um, there was another case where a professor at Cal Poly um, was sending pledges to vote for Hillary Clinton to his students basically trying to strong arm them into supporting her. And he lied about his email being hacked when he um, was found out about this. And I was able to prove that he was lying and the university launched an investigation into his email habits. Um, there was another case right here in DC actually where a fraternity at George, uh, excuse me, American University wanted to host a fundraiser for veterans. Um, one of the nicest things you can do, right? What could be the problem with that? Well, the university took issue with the fact that the name of the fundraiser was Badminton and Bougie, which of course is a play on a popular hip hop song title. The university said that that was cultural appropriation. So they threatened to cancel the event. And thanks to our reporting, that story got covered by the Washington Post, Fox News, Barstool Sports, and a bunch of other nationally recognized outlets and the university reversed its position. So for me, working at Campus Reform and covering those types of stories was a way to give back to students um, who were going through a lot of the same things that I did when I was an undergrad and um, being able to help them out um, with the power of you know, a national media outlet because when I was on campus, I didn't really have that same support. So I was really lucky to be able to give it to them. 
Amber, that's a pretty impressive record. Um, and also, I mean, all those liberal professors, I hope they uh, end up seeing you and uh, you, you are probably making them either embarrassed or uh, uh, making them proud that you were the student that did that. And you also appeared on Fox and Friends for Fox for a report with Scott, uh, John Scott, Fox News Life. It's my understanding you even appeared in OAN. And how did all this start? I mean, for early careerists as journalists, I mean, anything that you can share with them of how you were able to get into these largest networks in such a short period of your time? Sure. Well, I took a lot of television training when I was at the Leadership Institute campus reform, probably, geez, 20 to 30 hours of television training before they would even put me on um, a, a TV network. And we learned all kinds of things like how to do your makeup, how to style your hair, uh, what colors to wear, uh, what not to wear, how to eliminate filler words, um, how to uh, speak coherently or, or what the time limit is for certain questions and how to get used to the fact that you have this earpiece in your ear, but you can't actually see the person that you're talking to. There's so much that goes into TV behind the scenes that I think people aren't really aware of. And that training was really invaluable to me. So I, I worked my way up. I started on One America News. I did hits on Newsmax, Christian Broadcasting Network, EWTN. And I think it was a couple of years before I was finally able to be booked on Fox and talk about current events and stories that I was working on. And it was a very cool experience. Um, I love doing Fox interviews. I watched the network a lot growing up. And so to be able to be on there as a young woman has been a really incredible experience. That's, that's amazing, Amber. You make us proud. Um, uh, Amber, I know CPAC just kind of got over and uh, you wrote an article, I believe. Um, any takeaway messages you think our viewers will benefit from those people that couldn't attend the CPAC? Yeah, so I, unfortunately, I didn't get to go this year. It was the first time in maybe four or five years that I haven't been to CPAC, but I was watching remotely and I had a lot of friends who went down there and had a great time. And I will say one thing that was really um, uh, encouraging was the fact that there were a lot of people and panels talking about the movement against um, school boards that started right here in Virginia. So talking about things like the rise in critical race theory, transgender policies of putting biological men on women's sports teams, or even worse in young women's locker rooms, and a lot of the other um, attempts to wrestle the right to a child child's education away from their parents. Um, which was infamously talked about by Terry McAuliffe on the campaign trail during the gubernatorial race. And so I think Virginia parents should be really proud of themselves and take a lot of credit for all of the great work they did over the past couple of years in making sure that their children are not being indoctrinated and making sure that they're kept safe from some of these predators like in Loudoun County who are trying to take advantage of these really misguided policies to harm children. And um, they really should give themselves a lot of applause because they have sparked a national movement where parents across the country are now paying a lot more attention to the curriculum, to the policies that their school boards are enacting and all of these things that maybe even before the pandemic, they weren't really aware of because their kids were going off to school every day and coming home and you'd ask them how school was and they'd say, oh, it was fine. And now parents are much more um, awakened to these issues and are really making a difference by either showing up to the school board meetings or even running for office themselves. So uh, Amber, I'm a Fairfax County mom myself. So I've been into numerous school board meetings and a lot of my friends and community members have been fighting. There's an organization called TJ Coalition that's just been up in arms about Asian American discrimination, reduction of meritocracy. And uh, no matter how much we try to tell the school board mem members, things seems to have not changed as much. In fact, yesterday there was a school board meeting where the entire school student, uh, the parents had to literally um, shout it out saying that this is uh, anti-Asian discrimination and so on and so forth. And they just left the building. So it's just like, we are trying to make them accountable, but thanks to journalistic efforts such as you, that it's just getting resonated. And the uh, same goes to kudos, go to Loudoun County Republican um, Committee Women, where they have been in schools each and every day trying to help school board members and um, uh, any bureaucrats that are sitting out there to make them understand that these are real issues. It's just good to know that nation is, uh, is paying attention because of all of the journalistic uh, efforts like you. So, so now moving on to international sta stage, Amber, 
there's a lot going on between uh, Russia and Ukraine, as you very well know. And only a quarter of uh, Americans really want major US involvement in Eastern Europe, and I don't blame them at all. Policy debate is raging as Russia escalates its attacks on Ukraine. Uh, sanctions don't seem to have really, really worked. Uh, if sanctions are not going to be effective, what do you think we should do next? In, get involved militarily? What do you think? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. And I'm almost always very skeptical of any military involvement. I really grew up in a generation where the first major um, political happening was 9-11. That was really the biggest first major international incident that um, you know young people like me really remember. And so our entire lives, really, we've been engaged in this war in the Middle East, and we are finally able to get out of it after two decades. And former President Donald Trump was trying to pull troops out of Syria as well, because as we know, that the civil war doesn't really involve the United States. And so I think it's really unwise for us to continue to get involved in these conflicts when they don't affect us directly. I mean, outside of oil prices, and we'll get into that and how the Biden administration's energy policies affected this. But there's a reason that American citizens don't want to send their sons off to die in a war that doesn't affect American national security, at least not at this point. And when you talk about getting involved militarily, whether it's uh, a crazy assertion from Lindsey Graham, I mean, I know he's a Republican, but I thought it was crazy that he wanted to assassinate Putin, or you have Adam Kinzinger um, calling for a no-fly zone, that means getting involved in a world war. I mean, we, you really can't sugarcoat it. If you're going to start shooting down Russian planes, then you are creating a war with Russia, NATO is going to get involved, and it's going to be a major uh, conflict. And these countries have, have nukes. So it's not something to be taken lightly. And Americans have seen what happens when we get involved in these, um, these regional issues, again, like in the Middle East. And really, we have nothing to show for our two decades in Afghanistan. And I think that's really unfortunate. And so we have to be really careful about um, the financial and, of course, life consequences of getting involved. And especially with the Biden administration in office, I, I don't think anyone really trusts that Biden can be the leader to effectively um, put in place a plan that is reasonable, that gets us what we want, which is for Russia to stop their aggression. Um, if there were another person in office, maybe we would be having a different conversation. But when you're talking about Biden specifically, I just don't I don't even know what plan he could possibly have that would be good for the United States and wouldn't escalate this into a place where we do have to send troops over. And that's the last thing that I think anyone wants. Uh, Amber, it's kind of sad that uh, you're a conservative and you say, but it's not only just conservatives, it's even Democrats. Uh, they just don't think uh, Biden has been effective, not only in this, but uh, every single day there is a tweet going on out there saying that he failed again. And this is coming from hardcore Democrats. So I think American people are starting to see that we can only be in denial for so long. So that's, uh, uh, that's really happening even for liberals at this point. Amber, as I, as I said, I do read quite a bit of your articles. Uh, uh, recently, I read one of your articles about Democrats doubling down on wasteful foreign aid, right? Thanks to Congress, I say the US taxpayers continue to fund gender program in Pakistan, which is, uh, which is after all the things that we saw with Afghanistan, I'm like, why would you want to go and fund gender program in Pakistan? I am still in shock when I saw that. Is that happening currently when Americans are struggling to get through lives with inflation, gas prices that's going on? That's unbelievable to me. What, what, what is your take on that? Yeah, to me, this is just proof that the people in power right now are the worst elite globalist cosmopolitans that really don't care about what's going on domestically, and they just want to preen in front of the world. I mean, how crazy it is it that gas is at all time high, and we are sending tens of millions of dollars to fund gender programs in Pakistan. We're spending $40 million to democracy build in places like Nicaragua and Argentina. We're paying for women to go to college in Afghanistan. Like, what are we doing? This is crazy. How much money are we sending over there that could be used at home to help homeless veterans or people who are facing food insecurity or people who can't get to work right now because they can't afford the oil prices? And so when you look at the situation that's happening in Russia and Ukraine, and then you see all of the wasteful foreign spending that's going on, it is no wonder that Americans do not trust 
this administration or Congress in general to get involved even further in a conflict like this when this is the way that they prioritize our taxpayer dollars. Yeah, uh, I completely agree with you, Amber. I'm I always I I say I'm a working mom. I have a kid in the house still, so I drive her around quite a bit for uh, I drive my daughter around for quite a bit for basketball, and then I drive to work back and forth sixty miles. Uh, yesterday, when I filled the tank in Costco, believe me, uh, it uh, was over seventy dollars. I'm uh, that is the tank that I used to fill for over forty dollars. So that's just a lot of money that kills over time. For a month, I'll be spending two hundred dollars more than usual. That's a big chunk of money for working parents like us. So it's just a shame on where our politicians' priorities are. Amber, I read another of your article, which really intrigued me because I'm very much into following big tech, tries to, trying to see what kind of things they're promoting right now. You recently spoke to Maria on Fox News about the new investigative series called Killer Apps. It looks like the program digs into the rise, uh, rise of dangerous social media trends, internet addiction, and facilitation of trafficking via social media. As you know, big tech plays a, a big role in promoting these dangerous contact, uh, content due to their profit incentives. So when you spoke to Maria, did she allude to any legislation in Congress to address these issues to keep our kids safe? Yes, there are quite a few bills floating around Congress. Um, Senator Marsha Blackburn has been at the forefront of quite a few of them, as has Senator Josh Hawley. And really what they're talking about is increased regulation for these apps so that these um, algorithms cannot be used to further addict teenagers um, to social media apps. And also for them um, to change their algorithms so that they're not censoring conservative content. I mean, this is really a twofold issue, I think where big tech companies, um, yes, are very politically biased and are preventing people from speaking freely. I think they had a direct influence on the election with the way that they wouldn't allow the story about Hunter Biden's laptop to be shared on Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube. I mean, that was a, just a couple of days before the election and they were censoring that really important piece of news, which a lot of Americans when polled said that would have potentially changed their vote in the 2020 election. So there's the political side of it, and then there's the side for families being really concerned about the way that their kids are using these social media apps. There's been a rise in suicide among teens, um, a rise in general insecurity, in loneliness, and all of these um, you know, sicknesses of despair. And a lot of it can be tied back to apps. I you know, grew up um, without social media until I was in my teens. And there's no question that things like Instagram and Snapchat and some of these other social media apps can really damage a young woman's self-esteem. And so I think obviously it's important for parents to be paying attention to what their kids are doing online, but we've reached a certain stage in society where it's almost impossible to tell your kid, you know, you can't have a phone or you can't have a Facebook or an Instagram. And these companies should bear some responsibility because they're American companies. A lot of them are very monopolistic and they're making a ton of money creating these programs that get kids addicted and then make them feel horrible about themselves and create this vicious cycle. So I'm really glad to see that Congress is taking this issue seriously. Absolutely, Amber. I have a middle school children, a child, especially with COVID, 90% of their education is happening on laptop. So when they come home, I mean, there's only so much amount of checking you can do with these kids. So it's very, very important big tech acts responsibly, especially because they make so much money out of it. So Amber, uh, I mean, I, while we are talking about young kids, I'm thinking about young girls, especially it's Women's History Month. I'm very passionate about women empowerment, growing and supporting and mentoring and educating women. So everyone feels empowered to grow, continue to grow our society economically and socially. Any advice for students, especially young girls and young women that are hoping to go to journalism field? And also through this program, I try to connect a lot of minorities into GOP and a lot of immigrants into GOP. So if you think about minorities, Authorities and um, uh, uh, even immigrants, journalism is not the first thing that comes on top of their mind. So are there any challenges exclusive to journalism that people need to know before young girls and young women want to, uh, want to jump into this field? There are a lot of challenges inherent in journalism, um, but I, I think every job, of course, comes with challenges. And I, the important thing to know about journalism, I think, is when you start out it's pretty tough um, in terms of financial security. And it does take a couple of years to get to a stable place. And that's just the name of the game. And so if 
people are really passionate about getting involved, they should be aware of that. Long hours, little pay, and a pretty thankless job, especially considering um, the fact that so much of the media is very biased and brings those of us who are trying to be honest a really bad name. I often feel the need to apologize for the fact that I call myself a journalist, but there's a really rewarding side of it too, um, which I've talked about a bit in terms of being able to make a difference by exposing a lot of the things that are going on in this country as well as abroad. Um, so there's trade-offs just like with any job. The one thing I always tell young women when they're looking for any career, not just a career in journalism, and I think this is so important in modern society because it really does get lost, is that women need to embrace their biological differences. We are naturally different from men, and that's not a bad thing. That's something to be celebrated. We have a lot of really great natural attributes and traits. And of course, you know, I'm speaking generally, statistically, this doesn't apply to everybody, but women tend to be more caring, more compassionate. We tend to be softer spoken. We like to avoid conflict. I think all of those things can be leveraged in a way that's really useful in the workplace if that's what they want to do. Um, there are, are ways to um, use that to your advantage. And of course, there's um, you know so many things about just femininity in general that I think are, are so appealing and, and we have to embrace that as women and not treat it as something to suppress or hide in order to achieve our goals. And I also always remind young women as well that it is okay to not want to make your career your life. It's okay to want a family, to get married and have kids or be a stay at home mom. And I think it's really unfortunate that so many of our modern media outlets keep pushing this sort of girl boss narrative as if there's only one way to be an empowered woman. And I think what empowerment means to me is making choices for yourself and celebrating those choices and the freedom for women in this country to live their lives the way that they choose. There's no right or wrong way to do that. And so I hope every young woman out there listening knows that you should be able to embrace the fact that you being a woman is beautiful and unique and special. And however you choose to use that as you grow into an adult um, should be celebrated. Amber, so very well said. I have a daughter myself. She has her own strengths and I have a son, a son too. He has his own strengths. I don't think there is any reason for us to mimic each other, just trying to be the other gender. I think through our strengths and uh, weaknesses, we can, there is so much to do in this world. Uh, we just really don't have to try to get into their space or them trying to get into our space just to make a mark in the world. We can make a mark in the world just being ourselves. Very well said. Um, so as you know, Amber, it's a Women's History Month. There's a lot of discussion in the media. I think you know there's a lot of liberal bias stories. There's a lot of questions about gender equality, gender equity, sustainable world, and so on and so forth. However, we can't ignore the data, right? So instead of looking back, I want to ask a futuristic question. The data uh, shows that uh, um, the gender equality will not be bridged for the next 100 years. How do you think the fight for gender equality will change over the next 100 years? Will we even attain true equality? Or do you even think that that is needed? Are we, uh, are we already achieved that in America and we are just making this as a history month, uh, trying to kind of make, uh, um, make a problem without thinking it through? What, what do you think of entire thing? Yeah, it's a great question. And I will say that I've certainly experienced instances of sexism in my career, but I think that everyone faces their own challenges um, based on their identity. And it doesn't do us any favors to view ourselves as victims or live in a victimhood mindset. And it certainly doesn't help us to think that these are deeply rooted systemic issues that are impossible to overcome unless we have the government come in and save us. We are all um, able to empower ourselves. We live in a free country. And if somebody is sexist to you, the beautiful thing is you can just tell them off. <laughs> um, and so I've always really gone through my career that way. And so I haven't really seen any instance of a woman not having the same rights as a man. I mean, we hear this, for example, in the narrative about the pay gap, which when you uh, remove things like women being out of the workforce to have children, or the differences in, in majors in college, or the differences in just how much time they take off. There are so many explanations for why women in, on average make less than men. And it's not because of discrimination. 
Um, so I think overall, women are extraordinarily free in this country. And while there are some cases of sexism, again, we are really empowered here and we should be embracing that and taking advantage of it. One of the concerns I really have over the next hundred years, as you mentioned, is the fact that we are facing a movement that tells us that biology doesn't matter. Um, and that there are biological men who can call themselves women and invade women's spaces, whether it's this uh, transgender swimmer at the University of Pennsylvania who's breaking women's records, or um, you know, you have people going into women's bathrooms and locker rooms and making them feel uncomfortable, and we're supposed to suppress our own desire for safety and comfort for 0.2% of the population that identifies as transgender. And so I think that is really harmful to women. Women deserve to have our own spaces. And I think it's perfectly right and correct to say that someone who was born with male genitalia cannot be a woman. There's something beautiful and unique about being a woman and that should be celebrated. And it's not something that you can do dress playing dress up or being a cosplayer. Um, that's something you're born as. And I. I really worry about what happens to womanhood if we allow people to take away that um, special part of us. Amber, I think I, I almost feel that you should be part of a debate on a, uh, a much bigger, larger scale, just trying to kind of uh, help people understand. I think people are concerned about gender equality for the next hundred years, which I think they should be. But I think your point of like, yes, let's be concerned about that. But the most concerning thing is trying to protect the womanhood right now. But that seems to be another issue that people tend yeah. to ignore. But I'm thankful to you for highlighting that. So Amber, what is one of the most important lessons you learned about Women's History Month, if you did, or you hope to learn, or what is that one women, female role model that you look up to? Yeah, it's a great question. I, you know, I, I love Women's History Month. I learned recently that International Women's Day is actually a communist socialist holiday. <laughs> which I did not know. Um, so I don't celebrate International Women's Day, but I think it's great to highlight the contributions of women throughout Women's History Month. Um, I have you know, so many women that I look up to. My mom, who I think is actually watching right now. So hi, mom, love you. Um, she is great and really raised me to be the strong woman that I am. Um, I also have so many female journalists I look up to just in terms of my profession, Megan Kelly, Molly Hemingway, um, Cheryl Atkinson, uh, there are so many talented female journalists um, on the conservative side that I think are doing really important work. And I love to watch them and see their careers flourish. Um, and um, I think, you know, just in general, Women's History Month should be a time where as conservatives, we're able to take back the narrative about womanhood and celebrating again, our, um, our biological uniqueness and celebrating the fact that no matter what the left says, you're not a traitor to your gender. You're not um, you know, brainwashed or just listening to your husband if you're a woman who happens to be conservative. And we are strong, powerful women who um, need to make our voices heard and talk about all the things that matter to us. Absolutely, Amber, you said your mom may be listening, but I do want to tell your mom that she should be very proud of the daughter she raised. Uh, I mean, you are just a strong, independent woman. There's not a one word that you said that I could even potentially disagree with you. And I'm just very uh, surprised at how well you articulated about what Women's History Month is and what we should be looking at uh, and not worry about the equality or equity. I think those are all very important topics, but from futuristic view, we need to be worried about what we need to be worried about. Um, Amber, I mean, we are in the last uh, minute or so. May I ask you to take you a minute or two and let our audience know if I missed asking anything, uh, uh, something you feel like it's super important uh, with regards to geopolitics that's happening or community politics. You're like, Shri, you should have asked me that. That's a great relevant topic. <laughs> if you think I missed that, I would love for you to express your views on that. No, I think you covered everything really, really well. I really appreciate your questions. Um, I Gosh, it was such a, a interesting for me to go back and sort of recount my career and some of the things that I've been doing since I graduated from college. And I just want to say to everyone who's listening, thank you so much for your support. 
Um, you should be really proud of yourselves for all of the change that you've made in Virginia. And I hope that we will continue fighting and we've seen what happens when we make our voices heard and we will win. Thank you so much, Amber. I thank you for joining and accepting the invitation very gracefully, being extremely prompt in communicating, although I know you're, you have an extremely busy schedule. I appreciate you joining in March to honor our Women's History Month and speak so eloquently about what we need to be focused on and what we shouldn't be focused on. So thank you once again. So thank viewers, you. good evening again, as we, uh, as we continue to do these conversations that count, uh, Along with Amber, um, Amber, I also have uh, uh, need to announce that Karina Lipsman, she is an Ukrainian born US citizen that is running to represent Virginia's eighth district in Congress, will be here uh, a week from now. And we also will have our honorable Lieutenant Governor Winsome Sears on Monday, March 21st at 6 p.m. right here. So please continue to support Fairfax GOP by subscribing to us. So if people like Amber and uh, Winsome joins the conversations that count, you'll get the live notification. I hope you all will continue to tune in and continue to support and continue to keep listening uh, to Amber. Amber is going to be on airs. Most of the time I see her beautiful young lady with a very strong conservative values and extremely intellectual. Uh, and I, uh, Amber, I hope you continue to race and I hope you continue to stay strong. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening.